قاعدين على باب البيت يعني داخلين الارض مقاومين وكانهم منفلتين عن القانون Coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu suspends his plan to overhaul Israel's judicial system after mass protests and nationwide strikes rock the country. Plus, the battle against terror heats up in the Palestinian city of Jenin, how Israel is working to stop new attacks before they happen, and living under a brutal blockade. Azerbaijan tightens its chokehold on Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the nation Monday night and put his government's judicial reform legislation on hold until after the long, month-long Passover recess. Some say the long assault by those opposing reform caused a deep division within the country, bordering on civil war. In his address, Netanyahu cited King Solomon and the wisdom of splitting the baby in two and said he wanted to avoid splitting the nation in two. When there's an opportunity to avoid civil war through dialogue, I, as Prime Minister, am taking a time for dialogue. I give a real opportunity for a real dialogue. We insist on the need to bring about the necessary corrections in the legal system, and we're given an opportunity to achieve a broad consensus. This is a very worthy goal. After the address, Israeli President Isaac Herzog asked Netanyahu and opposition leaders Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid to work together to find a compromise. They agreed. We will show up at the president's residence. We will extend our hand. I call on Netanyahu to take away the threats, ultimatums and extreme statements that keep us away from the goal. Stop everything and send relevant teams to the president's residence. We will work to strengthen democracy, improve governance and maintain the independence of the judicial system. The White House applauded Netanyahu's decision. Democratic societies are strengthened by checks and balances and fundamental changes to a democratic system should be pursued with the broadest possible base of popular support. And so that's what we're going to continue to call for. Yet proponents of the legislation said the law was designed to bring a check and balance on what they called Israel's runaway judicial judiciary, arguing that the judicial system has had little or no restraint on it for decades. And many saw nearly 12 weeks of street protests as an attempt not just to win the debate over judicial reform, but to topple the government with accusations of the end of democracy and a dictatorship. I don't remember that at the time that the levels of hatred were this violent were this um, supported by the media, were driven by the media. Israeli commentator Carolyn Glick says the intense internal strife put Israel in peril in light of Israel's number one threat in the region, Iran. People who don't want Israel to take action against Iran, of all stripes and sizes, would want Israel to be submerged in domestic rioting and discord to make it impossible as a practical matter for the army, for the government, for our intelligence arms to concentrate and focus on the task at hand, which is taking out a sufficient percentage of Iran's nuclear capabilities to keep them off the ability to develop a nuclear arsenal. 
We spoke further with writer and commentator Carolyn Glick about her take on recent events and what she sees as the potential dangers of preventing Prime Minister Netanyahu from moving forward with his platform. Gadi Eisenkot, who's the former chief of staff of Israel, who, who is now a member of Knesset in the central left party that continues to flirt with the government and said, well, maybe we'll talk to you, maybe we'll reach a deal with you, maybe we won't, but first you have to stop legislating. And, and the head, another former chief of staff, Gadi uh, uh, Benny Gantz, who was also the former defense minister, uh, said um, yesterday on TV that they would they would uh, talk, they would deign to speak and accept the results of the election if if, uh, if Netanyahu um, deep sixes the uh, legislation, the judicial reform legislation. Um, and so, you know, he said that this is very dangerous. And what he was referring to was Iran. He was referring to Hezbollah, Iran's uh, Lebanese proxy that controls Lebanon. And uh, the Palestinians, whose levels of terrorism have massively uh, escalated over the past uh, two years, and just uh, since January, you've had 50 terrorist attacks, uh, at, at least, it, depending on how you count, if you count uh, stoning attacks and if you count Molotov cocktail attacks against Israeli motorists, it's, it's actually higher. So um, I think the 50 is just shooting attacks. And, and so... We've had a lot of terrorism here. The Palestinians are in a succession crisis, and the way that they, the way that they fight it out and decide who's going to be in charge is by killing Jews. So the more people that you kill, the more Jewish people you kill, uh, the more powerful you are politically. You know, within in in internal Palestinian affairs. So we're seeing a lot of that. So he was looking at Iran, that thanks in large part to the Biden administration's policies. Um, is it's really just at the nuclear threshold and and about to become a, a threshold nuclear state if they haven't already crossed that that threshold, and the Biden administration is is pretending that this is they you know not pretending that they're they're making it clear that they're fine with that, um, and uh, so we're we're at a very precarious moment regionally from a strategic perspective, from a military perspective, it's not the end of Israel. I always feel like, you know, you wake up in the morning and you see what's happening around you and you get so upset. I do. And and you feel hopeless. But then you have to always remember, and I say this to my children, I say it to myself, I say it to my husband, I say, I say it, you know, in my personal life and I also say it in my public life, that we always have to remember that tomorrow is another day. And the fight never ends, and we always think we're going to get to a point, and we're finally going to win. But it, even if even if we had been able to do it at this time, it wouldn't have been over. And yeah. you always have to go on. I mean, it's not only that we don't have any other choice. I mean, this is what we're living for. We're living we're living for this country. We're living for the freedom of the Jewish people, our self determination, our 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 nation state, our our. Our lives uh, of of who we are, and you know, you don't give up on that fight ever, and it's never easy. But that's just what life yeah. is for. And Carolyn also says in the Psalms that he that watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And you have a lot of people around the world will be praying for uh, Israel and uh, the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you. And uh, we also, you know, we feel it. You know, Jerusalem isn't just the capital of Israel. It's the capital of the Judeo-Christian civilization. And that's also one of the reasons why we're so targeted by people who want to destroy that civilization, who want to destroy the Western world. Because if they can, if they can do that, if they can convince a sufficient number of Israelis that it really isn't worth it, and they might as well just join some sort of global, you know, post, post-nationalist world government, government or something, then, then there won't be any more church either. So, I mean, yeah. you're right. They, like, it, it, you, he who blesses Israel is blessed because the, 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 the seeds of all of our identities are found in our Torah, are found in the, in the, in the stones of the city of Jerusalem. And that's just how it is. We so. continue and, uh, and keep looking up. Thank you, Carolyn, for joining us. Thank you so much, and God bless all of you for your support for Israel. Up next, Israel is working around the clock to stop terror attacks before they happen. We take you inside one city where the fight against terror 
has reached new heights. As the Muslim holy month of Ramadan begins, Israel is on heightened alert against the possibility of terror attacks. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl visited an important military installation, the Eyes of Israel to the East. Ramadan comes as Israel has already carried out hundreds of counter-terrorism raids in the Palestinian Arab cities of Nablus and Jenin over the last year. There are strong forces on various sides that are trying to escalate the situation and to bring about a real rupture in uh, the fabric of life here. From a security position on Mount Ibal, overlooking Nablus, former IDF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricas says the situation is extremely tense. There's various Palestinian factions and organizations that are constantly enhancing their amount of attacks and the terrorist activity that they do. There's a very weak and corrupt Palestinian authority that isn't stopping that from happening. There are external factors, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and Iran, that are trying to influence the situation in Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem in order to uh, bring about violence. Conricus says stabilizing the situation on the ground can help prevent the violence that often happens during Ramadan. Historically speaking, during Ramadan, Israeli security forces try to do the least necessary in order to maintain security and thwart terror and defend Israel, but without enhancing operations in such a way that could be interpreted or used by Palestinians as an excuse to basically start attacks. Janine Governor Akram Rajoub blames Israel for trouble in his city. Regardless of what the Israelis are promoting that there are gunmen and organizations, the citizens in Janine are being killed in front of their house and in their streets, and they're not being killed anywhere else. Rajoub told visiting journalists that although Israel has more firepower than his people, they still have the right to defend themselves. This is the reality of Janine. Regardless of what the Israeli media and security promote, our people live under occupation, and they have the right to resist the occupation in all its forms. The lands of 67 are the lands of the occupied Palestinian state. Israel has controlled biblical Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, since the end of the 1967 Six-Day War. Palestinians still claim the area as their own. Israeli Reserve Brigadier General Amir Avivi counters that Jewish communities or settlements in the West Bank help stabilize the area. Now, if you take the Jewish communities, Israeli Defense Forces lose control. If the IDF loses control, the Palestinian Authority loses control. As part of the 2005 disengagement, Israel removed four Jewish communities from the northern West Bank. Once we took the northern towns out, the situation completely deteriorated here, and not only for Israel, but also for the Palestinian authorities. They lost control. Conrica says Israel's immediate strategy is to stop terrorism before it happens. Israel does it by using very specific and real-time intelligence generated by security organizations and goes and tries to apprehend terrorists in their beds or in their homes or their hideouts before they're able to do attacks, trying to distinguish between civilians and those who are up for no good, violent activity, terrorists, etc., and trying to allow Palestinian civilians to go on with their lives as much as possible. Conrica says it's clear that had the army not stepped up its combat pace, there would have been an exponential increase in terror attacks against Israelis. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Mount Ibal and Janine. Coming up, the situation grows dire for Armenians suffering from a crippling blockade in Nagorno-Karabakh. Why activists fear Christianity is on the line. The situation for Armenian Christians in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh continues to deteriorate and threaten lives. An ongoing blockade of the isolated territory is depriving families of food, medicine, and resources. Billy Hollowell has the update. The situation is now very, very serious. Indeed, it has been said by people it may indeed be an 
impending genocide. Those foreboding words from Baroness Caroline Cox, a prominent member of the UK's House of Lords, summarize the state of affairs in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's been more than a month since Azerbaijani protesters blocked the only road into this small landlocked region, preventing the transport of food, medicine, and other essential needs. Well, I'm afraid it's a continuity of aggression by Azerbaijan against the Armenians. Uh, The little land of Nagorno-Karabakh was relocated by Stalin inside Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan has been trying to uh, carry out ethnic cleansing of the Armenians uh, from there for a long time. As the blockade persists, the 120,000 predominantly Armenian Christians living there are suffering and pleading for assistance. The shortage of food is now getting desperate. The shortage of medicines is very, very serious, especially medicines like um, insulin for people with diabetes. And the transfer of patients from uh, Karabakh into Armenia needing urgent medical treatment, that has been very, very much stymied. One has already died. So it is a very dire situation indeed. Gayane Belgarian's four-year-old daughter, Monica, suffers from liver cancer. The mother recently sounded the alarm about her child being trapped inside Nagorno-Karabakh and risked missing life-saving treatment. We were uh, frightened and we were really uh, worried about this situation because her life depends on this uh, treatment. After weeks of anxiously awaiting transport, the Red Cross helped the family exit. Still, Gayane warns that other ailing residents still need help. We have no um, necessary equipment, we have no doctors, and we have no, like, nothing, because uh, the road is blocked, we cannot go out, uh, we don't have uh, doctors who can come there and uh, have a necessary uh, treatment. Baroness Cox also warned about another element of the crisis, the potential destruction of Christian churches, historic landmarks, and entire cultures. This could be another stage of genocide, destruction of Christian people, destruction of Christian heritage, and we need to pray. The annihilation of Christians is very much part of the agenda of getting rid of the Christians. and. Um, the uh, that's one of the things that the Armenians are really worried about, because they will lose uh, part of their unique Christian heritage. As the chaos continues, prayers for peace, ease tensions, and resolution are desperately needed. This is Billy Hollowell for CBN News. Still ahead, walk in the footsteps of Jesus and take a stroll on this biblical superhighway in the city of David. In ancient Israel, the Jewish people obeyed the biblical commandment to travel to Jerusalem three times a year for the temple sacrifice. One of those occasions was for the Passover holiday in the spring. 2,000 years later, the road they walked on is uncovered for all to see. Take a look. They call it the biblical superhighway, the pilgrim's path that led to the Jewish temple in ancient times. The places and events and the peoples that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem, for Christians, for Jews, it all happened here in the city of David. This is where the beating heart of Jerusalem is. We're talking about the Pool of Siloam. We're talking about Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. We're talking about the city of David. The pilgrimage road links them all together. For Jews in ancient days, their pilgrimage began here at the Pool of Siloam. It's a mikveh or ritual bath. It's the size of two Olympic swimming pools. They would purify themselves here before going up to the Temple Mount to worship God. The historian Josephus says that 2,000 years ago on the pilgrimage festivals, there would have been more than 2 million people going up on pilgrimage. That's a lot of people who need to bathe. The pool is also where Jesus healed the blind man as recounted in the book of John. Its location was hidden by a road until 15 years ago when a sewage leak led to excavations, the discovery of the pool, and much more. The archaeologists, when they find the Pool of Siloam, so they understand if that's the pool, and they know where the temple stood on the Temple Mount some 2,000 years ago. The same Temple Mount is today. Zev Orenstein with the City of David Foundation says, archeologists wondered how the pilgrims traveled from the pool 
to the Temple Mount. So the archaeologists widen the excavation, and we are standing on the very answer to that question. We are standing atop the ancient pilgrimage road. These are the stones that Jesus would have walked on on his way up to the temple. And now the significance of the excavation of the pilgrimage road is that for the first time in 2,000 years, visitors will be able to walk all the way from the Pool of Siloam up to the Western Wall. The word in the Bible, the Hebrew words, is aliyah regel or mm -hmm. ole regel. Now what we understand that to mean is it's a spiritual ascent. You're going up to the temple, yeah. going to Jerusalem. It's a very holy place. But Chris, when you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. Because as we're walking right now, and I'm sure you could feel it, mm -hmm. we're walking uphill. And it was more than that. This would have been like Times Square. You would have had on both sides of the road, and keep in mind, the road is about three, four, five times wider than what we see over here. You would have had shops, stalls along both sides of the road. This is the center of Jerusalem from a spiritual perspective, from a communal perspective, also from a, a commerce perspective. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, the road took 10 years to build from 20 to 30 AD and was constructed by Pontius Pilate. One of the major issues of Jerusalem is that it's a living city. All the layers, all the archaeological layers are built on top of one another and the modern uh, living uh, quarters and everything is built on top of the archaeological layers. Excavation manager Ari Levy says uncovering the road is a major engineering feat. We have modern neighborhood uh, just above our heads and we don't want it to collapse. After each meter that we take out, uh, each meter of soil, we enter an arch like uh, construction like this. This supports the entire weight of what we have uh, above us. Along the route, you can see many places where the road remains intact and others where it's destroyed given its violent history. We know that the Romans, they destroyed Jerusalem. And if you would find everything perfectly intact, well, it wouldn't seem like much of a destruction. Among the discovered treasures are small coins minted during the Great Jewish Revolt before the Romans destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in 70 AD. Scholars often wonder why the Jews made worthless coins instead of weapons. Orenstein has the answer. The Jews of Jerusalem understood that the Romans were likely going to destroy the city, hmm. but they also believed that one day in the future, their descendants would return and find these coins, and they would know what their ancestors lived and died for, for a free Jerusalem. And here we are nearly 2,000 years later, standing along the very same pilgrimage road here in the city of David, in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. Half of the pilgrimage road will open soon to the public, and within a few years, all the way from the Pool of Siloam to the Western Wall. That will give visitors a first-hand experience of what it was like to worship God in the time of Jesus. Since we filmed this story, the Pilgrim's Road has become open for private tours, and the City of David National Park hopes to open it to the general public in the near future. Plans are currently underway to complete the excavations of the Pilgrimage Road and the entire Pool of Siloam. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.